Um, thank you for coming into this talk. Uh, it's going to be on gRPC, so it's going to be very fun. Uh, and uh, yeah, so just a quick, let me see to make sure my stuff works. Okay. Come on. OK, there it is. So uh, I'm a site reliability engineer in Zapier. And uh, this is my Twitter handle and website in case you want to learn more about me or just you know want to follow, talk, whatever. Uh, this is how you can contact me. Uh, I'm going to be putting up my slides uh, on, on my website. So it's going to be there. And uh, you, sh you should be able to definitely get them. And uh, yeah, I think I'm ready. Uh, so uh, quick disclaimer, I really like cats. You're going to probably see some uh, calf, cat GIFs. And I don't know, not GIFs. And uh, another thing you should be aware of is that gRPC or any RPC uh, is not going to solve all your problems. You're still going to have you know, interesting issues, edge cases, uh, architectural decisions you have to make. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, this is not a catch-all or silver bullet. Uh, and another thing is that I'm going to be talking about tech history a little bit to make sure that we understand how we came to uh, where we are right now and, and why like gRPC started you know, becoming uh, pretty uh, you know, supported and, and liked. Uh, and uh, some of these notes are going to be like, I found out that tech history at times are murky and sometimes very, very opinionated. And uh, you know, sources really don't match. So uh, please forgive me if you find anything like that. And, and uh, chalk up to you know, uh, people writing very interesting histories. Um, OK, so uh, some basics. Uh, so you want, to, you want your web services to talk to each other. Uh, there's a couple problems you have to think about at first. Uh, first one is how one system can request data from another system, uh, which specific parameters are needed in the data request, uh, what, will be, what, be, what will be the structure for that data. Uh, so you can use like, things like JSON or XML. If you use XML, there's something, some like wins with that. Or it can be even binary files. Who knows, right? But you have to decide on that structure. Uh, another thing is that you have to have standardized error messages to make sure that everyone understands what the hell happened, why did that communication fail, and what's going on, right? So that's the basics for any type of communication. Uh, and uh, this is going to be a very you know, simple in entry to RPC. Uh, and RPC is a remote procedure call, is where a computer program calls a procedure to execute in a different address space, basically another computer. And uh, the code, basically, when a developer is coding this, his code for an RPC uh, architecture, he doesn't have to worry about how the message is going to get there or uh, you know, how what, what, what the detail of that communication is going to happen. Like, he doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, and uh, this is how it would work. So you would have a client and a server. Uh, the client would actually talk to the client stub. And the client stub abstracts whatever communication that needs to be happen uh, with the RPC runtime. And uh, this, you know, the signal or the message gets sent over to the server. Uh, and the ser server routine actually gets that information from the server stub. And uh, you know, the, the process returns back. Uh, nothing too crazy. So uh, just a quick reminder, you know, uh, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And uh, this is very true for tech history. Uh, you're going to definitely see some patterns uh, coming back uh, in, to life. Uh, so Corba, 1991. Anyone dealt with Corba here? Nice. So uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> So uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, Corba was basically an implementation of RPC and uh, provided some, uh, you know, commonly needed requirements for transactions, security, events, time, as well as others. Uh, it was mostly using object references uh, when it was uh, using the uh, when you were doing the communication. And but it's the same simple, uh, you know, idea of what RPC is, right? You still have the stub uh, that allows you to, you know, communicate with the server, and uh, you know that you. And that stub would be uh, used, and and for that communication, and the developer would supposedly need to know about how, uh, you know, what's happening at the background and how that, how that communication is going on, actually, um, supposedly. Uh, so Corba has lost some popularity in at, in, in time. Uh, one of the reasons is it had complexity in implementation. Uh, as, I don't know, if, since we have a couple Corba implementers here, uh, it's you would know that simple a hello world will require multiple methods methods or, or configurations or setups. And that's how it was written. Uh, it had a steep learning curve. Like, not everyone was able to just pick it up the next day and you know, start working on it. Uh, and sadly, it had some op bad open source practices uh, when deciding on standards. Uh, some of these standards were voted on without implementation details or examples. And usually, 
vendors responded to RFPs even with known technical flaws, and they kind of supported those technical flaws going forward instead of saying, okay, like, let's not continue this way, um, which kind of made things a little bit hard. Uh, so around 1999, uh, what really started changing, uh, you know, the tech world was SOAP uh, protocol, uh, which is a messaging protocol that has, you know, specifications for exchanging structured information. So this is a divergence, I think one of the most important divergence that happened away from RPC, uh, you know, uh, patterns. Um, and uh, it happened in 1999, and what it brought to the table is a solid messaging format, uh, message exchange patterns, uh, underlying transport protocol, message processing models, and protocol extensibility. So who worked on SOAP? Probably more fingers, yes. That's what I expected. Um, so, uh, Sadly, you know, as time went by, SOAP kind of lost pop popularity, uh, but it came down to simplicity and utility. Really, like, what, would you require everything that SOAP provided or not? Uh, and a lot of new frameworks that were coming up, popular ones, uh, Ruby from Rails or others, uh, these frameworks were not developed with SOAP implementations in mind. Uh, JSON started replacing XML as a serialization technology, uh, for good or worse. And uh, to be honest, sending simple and small messages was more important than being you know, complying to certain rules or, or standards. Um, and that kind of changed the whole tech industry, right, the mobile device. Um, so since everything got smaller, uh, you know, REST, REST came in, and uh, REST uh, was a, is a software architecture style that defines some of these constraints. And I want you to remember the first slide where I talked about, like, the requirements, and we're always trying to standardize around these requirements and try to provide those requirements for any solution we come up with. And what, any pattern we come up with, because, because we have to, uh, and uh, for any good, you know, uh, setup or protocol, and uh, you know, REST is, is is a different software architectural style that kind of helps with that, uh, and uh, REST has its own constraints, right? Client server is a client server architectural architecture is stateless, it has statelessness, and when I say statelessness, sometimes my uh, colleagues kind of get confused. They, they think it's called it's uh, applic it's resource state. This is not a resource state, we're talking about application state, where the, app, where the server actually keeps in mind and takes uh, a state of what the client is doing and, and, and the context and, and basically keeping the, keeping the client details and, and uh, you know, providing re responses accordingly. Uh, and then you have cacheability, layer system, and a uniform interface. And when I talk about uniform inf interface, here I'm talking about resource identification requests, resource manipulation to representations, self-descriptive me messages, and hypermedia, which is kind of cool. Okay, so uh, next slide isn't bashing REST. I'm just you know, stating some things you need to do to support REST, uh, RESTful architecture. Uh, so if you're developing for RESTful uh, APIs uh, for a large team uh, or a multiple teams in, in, a, in a company, uh, you need to worry about clients and how these, how these uh, you know, microservices or services talk to each other. And you need to develop clients for these services. Uh, now you're suddenly you're duplicating that effort. Um, another thing that I've noticed, especially with you know, large companies that have multiple services that talk to each other, is standardization around serialization, right? Uh, how are you gonna decide how to serialize and deserialize your application? What are the standards uh, you know, going forward? Uh, I also noticed that, uh, you know, Unlike, uh, unlike SOAP 1.2, uh, it doesn't actually guarantee asynchronous processing reliability and security. Uh, and uh, you know, you kind of need, it's kind of up to the, the team to uh, you know, handle that and, and manage that. Uh, and, and it's not a downfall, it's just that you know, sometimes you really don't need to bother that much because your system is you know, fault tolerant or is able to handle uh, failures. And uh, you have this, and then regarding security, you have another layer for security, right? Uh, Another thing that comes up usually is, is, to, is to compress all these REST requests, right? Should you, should you compress it? Like, is it worth actually compressing it? Uh, so there's some architectural decisions that you have to make around that or design decisions you have to make around that um, when you're going forward. Uh, and another thing is about uh, streaming uh, data. Like, how, do you, how does REST full APIs handle streaming data? I mean, you can definitely do that, uh, but really should you? And were you able to actually make sure that your your pattern is still a RESTful architectural pattern or, or, or design, right? Uh, like how are you gonna manage application state? Well, that's a trick question. You shouldn't be actually managing application state to be truly RESTful, right? Um, okay, so this is, this is where we are. This is the past and now uh, some, you know, Google created something called gRPC, uh, which is amazing and, and 
and kind of comes back like there's this full circle. It almost feels like we came to a, uh, to a full circle here. But you know what gRPC brings here is an RPC framework that can run in any, any environment and is able to connect services across data centers um, using and has like s s pluggable support for simple requirements or needs in, in the modern tech world, such as load balancing, tracing, health checks, and authentication, and is also applicable for the last mile of the distributed con uh, computing to connect to devices, uh, such as mobile devices and whatnot. Um, we can get questions at the end. Uh, I forgot to set, mention this, truly sorry. Uh, there's no questions, and uh, I'll definitely, I'm, I'll be available in the corridor for further questions or discussions. Uh, so, talk about gRPC. What gRPC is trying to do is try to avoid past mistakes, while also making sure that we don't lose the good patterns that we had for all these other services or protocols that I just showed. Uh, so they are definitely trying to avoid complexity, and uh, they're, sh they're trying to avoid uh, you know steep learning curve. Uh, they have a, definitely an open and welcoming open source co community, uh, and you know they really help you out at the beginning. And uh, I think what's the best here is that architectural changes are open to challenges and not controlled by vendors. Uh, you can actually bring up something up, and they you know uh, definitely respond very well. Uh, another pattern, uh, maybe away from Corba or, or Corba's uh, you know, shortcomings is that services, not objects. Messages, not references. That's, that's the uh, pattern they're following. It supports streaming, uh, which is pretty amazing. It's payload agnostic. It has a standardized amount, like status codes. And uh, you can implement it with different languages, multiple languages. And Python is one of, is one of them. And uh, so you know, it actually fulfills all the requirements or the needs you would need for a good web service and, uh, that I showed at the first slide. Uh, and it's also, as you might notice, it's kind of uh, keeping in mind what we kind of gained from the other uh, protocols uh, since then, uh, since uh, Corba. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, just like any RPC uh, you know, pattern here, uh, not, you would see something similar. Uh, this is actually taken from uh, gRPC's own website, and I find it like beautiful, a very simplistic way to show things. Uh, so you would have a gRPC server and gRPC stubs, which the clients to use to communicate. And you can actually use any language uh, for these services to talk to each other, and you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to worry about how, how that communication happens. The developer doesn't have, of the of the of the code doesn't have to worry about how that communication happens uh, at the back end, uh, which is very helpful. Okay, uh, so one thing you have to uh, here in the previous slide, uh, I did. There's like a, something called proto request, and uh, that might actually, you know, won't make you wonder what that means. Uh, so we're actually here talking about protocol buffers. Uh, it is Google's mature open source mechanism for serializing structured data. Uh, you can still use JSON, by the way. Uh, you know, I've seen people use gRPC and JSON, but, but really, would you want to do that? Like, that's a question you would need to ask yourself. Uh, but uh, it's very easy to understand, and, and it's pretty, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's structured. I think it's very readable. Uh, and here you can see a uh, you know, uh, message uh, person, and that has uh, different fields. And these fields have unique IDs. And I'm going to show a different example, but basically this is how it be looking look, uh, would be looking like. <sighs> OK, so just going to show some code and uh, have fun with that. So uh, every microservice, every gRPC service, I should say, uh, usually starts with a protofile definition. Here you actually define what your services are going to be and uh, what the message is between the that's going to be used within the communication for these services are going to look like. Uh, so here you're defining uh, the syntax of Proto3. You define your package, which is going to be hello world. And uh, you also have a, a service definition here called greeter. And it has a, you know, it uses something called say hello. That gets a parameter of hello request message and returns a hello reply message. And uh, hello request and hello reply are defined as such. So these are messages. And this is the, the service. And uh, in hello request, here you can see I have a you know, field called name. And it's a string. And what? wait, one is not a string there. So what is that one? So that one is actually a unique ID that is used uh, when you know, sending the messages. And uh, it's a field number. And uh, that, that's only unique for that specific uh, message. So in the next message, we can another, have another field unique ID one with the string and a message. And that's actually all you need to start your uh, service. Uh, the next step is to uh, 
So this is the service. And the next step is to actually uh, generate the client and server code. So gRPC comes with amazing tooling where you can actually pre-generate your code for the stubs. And uh, it's very easy to, I mean, it looks kind of a kind of long, but to be honest, like once you automate this, you don't really need to worry about this. Uh, but you know what, what you do is basically you call the um, uh, call the tool, and then uh, you point to your directory and a path that has the profile, and you define what plugins you're going to pull in to get things working. And here I'm running this for the server, and then I'm running this for the client. Now what this does is it generates these two files here. Uh, so this is one of them, and it says generated by gRPC. Python protocol, compile plugin, do not edit, and which is a friendly reminder for that. Uh, and then another one. So these two files uh, you would place with your uh, server, and uh, you'll actually start using it. And uh, so the beauty is that I, I kind of abstracted a couple things here. I don't know if you noticed this. I abstracted how serialization is going to happen. I abstracted my, uh, you know, my messaging, uh, how the messaging is going to lo look like, and what services going to, or service definitions, and, and all of that. Right? They're they're all like abstracted out there. And uh, so this is how I would use this in a server. Uh, this is a very simple server, gRPC server, probably not what you want to use in production environment. Uh, although I say that I'll, I'll be putting this in uh, you know, a link in my you know, website, and then there'll be a GitHub link, and this is what it's going to be pointing to. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward, where basically you have a greeter, and the uh, greeter is an object of greeter service, sir. You know, that's how they name things there. In, uh, when they generate the code. Uh, and uh, here you can see the method say hello. And the say hello uh, basically replies with hello and gets the request uh, in a name field, right? And then responds back as such. Uh, and then when you create, you create a serve method, this is what you're going to do. Uh, you have a gRPC server definition. Uh, this uh, futures uh, thread is basically the number of threads that's going to be running uh, in your pool. Uh, and uh, which is very helpful, especially in production environments where you want to scale uh, according to load. Uh, and uh, here you define, you say, hey, just use this uh, greeter and server. And uh, after that, I'm printing a message here because I usually forget the port. Uh, so this will help me. And uh, then you run this, basically define, hey, run, use this port here. And uh, you can definitely make sure that the, you can use an insecure port or you can use an insecure port. Uh, here, I'm, because I want to kind of skip on a couple of configurations that you would need, I'm just going to say, just use the insecure port, and this is the port number. And uh, here, I'm saying, start the server. Uh, this is just to make sure that we can control and shut down the server if needed. And uh, this is where I'm calling the server. So pretty straightforward. Uh, so let's run this and see what happens. Oops, uh, well, let's cancel this. Oh, that's nice. Uh, let me try this very quickly. Come on. Okay. How about that? Okay, so let's make sure I set that up. There we go. So I started a server. Um, and that's all you need. So one thing to be aware of, though, uh, you can't just open the browser like a RESTful, in a RESTful client where you, uh, you know, simple, simply move, oops, that's not good, where you simply, uh, you know, open a browser and, and uh, test out things. Uh, here you kind of need to use a different tool that actually would, uh, you know, be able to open or read what the message, what gRPC is sending over or the sub is sending over. So there's a nice tool called Bloom RPC that allows you to point to a profile and generates the client for you. So basically, it's doing what RPC does, uh, gRPC does best here. And here you can actually test your code, and you can set, point to a, a port, and uh, you can have a host name, and this is your message that you're sending over, the name, and when you run this, you get a hello pi Ohio, which is kind of cool. OK, so let's go back to the code. Uh, and so that was a server. Uh, so how complicated would the client be? Well, not really that much, because again, the library is already generated for you. So you just have to like start pulling in tying things up. And you don't have to tie too many things up. That's the beauty of it. Like, If this was Corba, you probably need to write a couple of, you know, at least a 
couple hundred lines of code. Uh, here in a couple lines of code, you're able to just basically connect to the stub and immediately start serializing and deserializing the messages and start reading and using them, which is kind of cool. Uh, and uh, here as you can see I'm using an insecure channel uh, for the client, uh, and I'm saying, hey, you know, send this, you know, use the stub. Uh, this is the message you want to send, which is Pi Ohio, and uh, greeter client received it, just printed that out uh, for for our sake, if needed. So uh, here I'm going to very quickly run the clients. There you go. So it's going to be Python. OK, there you go. So that's it. And uh, it, it was able to communicate back into uh, the server and get a response and uh, you know print that response. That's all it did. Uh, so that was cool. but. You know, hello worlds are always deceiving. Uh, you know, it, you can, it shows you you can like use a couple lines of code and get everything working. Well, there's things to consider in production, and I'm going to go over them very quickly. Uh, so, first consideration is ramping up teams. What if your teams don't know what gRPC is or don't know how to use it? Well, the good news is that you know gRPC has very good documentation, in, in my opinion, way better than what Corba had to offer, or even SOAP, to be honest, or even Rust, uh, and. <laughs> Uh, so that's that's a good, definitely a good plus. Another good advice is to make sure that you build up a project template for all the languages that you're going to support for gRPC services, and uh, make sure that you build up your CI/CD pipeline. And uh, to make sure that once the teams start going, uh, all the builds of these uh, stubs and clients are all automated, and there is no manual intervention that needs to be done. Uh, you want to make sure that that's all automated beforehand, especially if you want to ramp up quickly. Uh, and you, you still need to write tests. That doesn't go away. So make sure that you write tests. Uh, OK, another question I usually get is how, do you, how are you going to manage all those protocol files, right? Because now you have all those files that you would need to use to generate uh, the clients and servers. Well, it depends on your architecture and structure. But if you already have a monolith repo, you can definitely keep them in the monolith repo. Uh, or if you're providing or selling a software product, you can uh, put that in a software product uh, so that way your uh, users can use them. Uh, and then regarding. If you have multiple repositories and you have multiple mi microservices, you probably want to keep those protocol files in a separate repository, a separate repository that can get pulled in. So those micro, uh, so the CI/CD pipeline can pull in those uh, protocol files uh, for those uh, microservices. Uh, don't use submodules. That's the worst decision you can ever make. Don't use, use Git submodules. Uh, just stay away from it. Trust me. Like that's that creates a huge amount of mess. Uh, another thing that you might want to do, especially for your teams, is to lint your protobuf files and make sure that it's standardized in, in a certain manner. Uh, Uber has an amazing tool here called Prototool. Uh, it definitely makes your life easier to uh, lint all these files and make sure that uh, you know, clients are generated correctly and, and whatnot. Uh, testing gRPC, uh, you still have to test. That's the bad news. Uh, and the good news is, uh, well, you don't have to worry about bad contracts that much anymore, uh, like you would need to do with a RESTful you know, service. Uh, because you know the client gets generated and basically you distribute that client for for them. Uh, as long as you don't change the field numbers for any existing fields, and any fields that you add are added as optional or repeated and not required. Uh, so that's that's the difference uh, you need to keep in mind. Uh, load balancing, uh, it's an amazing topic. I would like like this would have been a session all by itself. Uh, but just so you know, remember that uh, gRPC is using HTTP2, and make sure that so any tools that you use is able to support HTTP2, and uh, you know, and make sure that you don't remember that you don't need service mesh out of the gates, right? Uh, you know, uh, you, until you do. <laughs> so uh, here you can see the benefits of uh, you know uh, proxy and client side. Uh, if you trust your clients, uh, use client side uh, load balancing. If you don't trust your clients, it basically use proxy. Uh, there's also uh, issues with high latency with proxy approach, uh, but uh, to be honest, you know, I think it comes down to trust, if you really trust that service or not. Uh, now, why would you use it? This is a good summary. If you have my, many microservices or services where you don't want duplication of effort to manage or create those clients, you would probably use gRPC. If you have streaming needs or streaming data that you have to manage, you would probably use gRPC. If you have multiple teams and you want to allow them to work in isolation, away, asynchronously, with a little bit less com communication, and uh, you would use gRPC. Uh, and also, it kind of solves everything that I just showed you in the RPC patterns, uh, you know, where developers don't need to worry about quite a bit of things uh, when they're developing uh, their code. So if you have any questions, catch me in between sessions.
uh, or DM me from my Twitter, follow me, and we can talk. Thank you for coming in. <laughs>